Uh, this is the OGM weekly call for Thursday, December 14th, 2023. Um, it is almost Christmas. And uh, and the world is wacky, um, which seems to be the status quo these days. So might as well get used to it. We're hoping that makes April's book an evergreen theme, but that's sort of a bad wish to have. Yeah. Um, this is uh, the on schedule for check-in round. We could check in and then start talking about whatever. So I'm going to offer that up and okay. see who see who'd like to check in, and we'll go from there. How about you start today? Sounds good. Happy to. Um, so I'm 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 as always trying to figure out how to explain who I am and what I do, um, and I, I keep trying to refine what's the what's the foundation or what's the outside wrapper or what's the core or i don't even know which metaphor applies best to all these things and for so i so the closest place i've kind of come to that is uh, some combination of trust and sense making and uh, that the two things are deeply intertwined because i by myself might try to do a lot of sense making and might even make a little bit of sense but unless somebody trusts me even just a little bit, they're never going to listen to, to my sense making. And that a lot of sense making doesn't make sense. Uh, a lot of decisions are made between people that have nothing to do with their self-interest or logic or science or anything like that. They have to do with many other forces that you have to acknowledge and, and deal with. But, but for me, the interplay of those two forces seems to be like at the core of what I, what I care about and what I do with, maybe the third complication of technology um, and the advent of the sudden sort of step function and capacity of machine learning, uh, which changes the game for a lot of things, uh, including our ability to trust each other because deep fakes are now easily possible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, a whole bunch of things are mixed in here. And my hope is that this description, this duo or trio of themes, topics, um, it make a nice foundation or umbrella or tent for the different projects that I'm doing, like neobooks uh, and, and everything else. Um, and I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll, when we free up to talk, I'll, I'll feedback. Welcome. Hi, Judy. Hello. We're, it's we're a few minutes late. No worries. Um, I, we're just doing check-in round, and I've, uh, I'm going first. Um, and so I'll, and I've just, uh, just reached the end of my, my little check-in, so... I think I will I will stop there. Can you do a 30 second recap? <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 figuring out how to explain myself, which is my perennial thing. And I think that the duo or trio of topics are trust, sense making, and then the effects of technology on all of the above. Thank you. That's my elevator pitch right now. It's it's not like, hey, I want to build a marketplace where people can trade stuff. So yeah. which is which is simpler i sort of had the same feeling i think i found finally my my goals you know the the uh uh it's too intense when you go to to uh an operating unit you know like the family kitchen or neighbor impact and so on because um you know what I'm talking about is just it's just uh, would really require intense personal engagement, you know, on a continued basis and so on, and and that just that would just hamstrung me completely. Um, so then it's not really fair to get to, to sort of uh, go in and out and um, and let, let people hang. You know, so you have to you have to. Um, find a role that where where you 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 can be beneficial yeah. and so that's what i what i uh what i found is uh, probably my niche you know? and so my kids actually helped me my daughter did the website my son 
you know, set me up with the, uh, uh, the, the newsletter that I just started now. Um, so, so because they're both in the, in the field, um, I just have to capture enough time from them. <laughs> and, but I, I, I mean, it's really, it's really difficult to, to observe, um, scary really you know to observe what's what's uh what the world around you is doing and and trying to bend it uh, uh a little bit towards uh you know, towards some some productive some self-help some uh, anticipation you know, some preparation um so i'm i'm always floating back and forth between Oh my God! Now there's nothing you can do here. This is uh, going down, and uh, oh, how exciting! There are people who want to make a change and participate, and and uh, you know how can we do that? How can we move this forward? But uh, I mean, honestly, the um, the uh, political process in the U.S. right now is just totally knotted up, uh, and and uh, um, the the this. Power structure that this power struggle you now going back and forth completely neutralizes our ability to to really do much of anything. Um, so so anyway, um, I, I got a, a pretty nice reception with the newsletters. Now I'm already at like seven hundred and fifty people who signed up for it, um, and I haven't really advertised it yet much. Um, so that's that's encouraging, but it's also a challenge because now you feel like um, you have to really carefully consider what to, what to post and what to do next. Now, um, yeah. So anyway, my partner and I uh, uh, from from uh, Climate System Solutions, we are working on starting um, a workshop in January for industry. Uh, uh, professionals now uh, and so we we plan on doing uh a 360 group meaning we want to have in there a farmer but also maybe a seed core maybe uh, a processor someone who is in the uh, wholesale retail section so we can have conversations across uh, a spectrum someone from the investment fund and we have had we've we have some great connections because we have done these webinars for you know, three years now and we had some pretty senior level people <laughs> on the panels um so if we can so, so we wanted to start pretty much OGN format you know have a weekly drop-in meeting and then out of that spin uh, specialized sessions that focus on on the more narrow very specific topic with specialists who are interested in that topic um so we'll start, uh, we're in the process of uh, developing materials I already wrote uh, an abstract. And uh, so we'll see if we can pull this off in January. My partner is extremely well connected you know, in the industry. He's uh, super engaged and, and people really respond to, to him calling. Um, so that, that, uh, um, that should be, I mean, we should, we should be able to, to get a starting shot now. Um, and I've done actually all my career, I've done sort of focus group uh, research while I was within Disney, you know, and while I was with uh, my, my next job. Um, I've always I had a monthly meeting where I pulled people from different departments together uh, and, and had conversations you now. And uh, and that that really assisted. You know, so basically, you know, it's a it's a focus group uh, function with preparation <clears throat> and follow up. So that's that's uh, that's my plan. We'll see where it goes. Well, it's uh, you and me, Judy. <laughs> Jesse, Jesse's not on video, but it doesn't mean she might want to check in. Totally fair. I can go first, Pete. Um, I guess I'm I'm not quite at the stage that Klaus is in terms of energizing, but I usually go into a year-end reflection on what it is I want to be doing for the next year, and 
it's sort of where can I contribute and what can I do to make a difference, um, recognizing time constraints and other things. And as Klaus has said, it's, it's a really disturbing time to try to figure that out and to figure out what organizations I could work with that would have an opportunity to have impact even on a local level in terms of attempting to change human behavior, invite humans to consider their state a little more carefully. And so I'm finding it harder this year because it doesn't feel as optimistic as it has in previous times. And that's influencing my energy levels a bit. I'm rotating off a board on the arts, which is okay. I'm still involved in some science and technology stuff in a couple different arenas, which feels like an area where I have more to contribute. But I'm just disappointed in humanity, I guess, in a way, in our inability to sort of think in a bigger picture than self-interest. Jesse, do you want to go next? <laughs> okay. Uh, in chat, so Jesse says she'll go after me. Um, uh, I've got all kinds of things going on. Um, I'm not sure which to report out on. I'll I'll pick a couple. Um, I've had I've been having conversations with a few folks about something that we've been calling intercommunity. Uh, so one of the things I do is is set up uh, infrastructure that tries to at least bump communities into each other. So uh, CSC Metamos is like that, Plex is like that. Um, and recently, t talking to a few other people who are interested in intercommunity stuff, um, I realized that the intercommunity people don't have a community. <laughs> um, there's a bunch of people doing in intercommunity work, but we don't talk very much. So um, uh, next year, early next year, I'm going to be talking with uh, a couple of folks about that to see if there's more that we can do to do more intercommunity stuff by doing it together. Um, so an intercommunity, intercommunity. Um, separately, this weekend, uh, I'm pretty excited. There's a, a kind of a tech movement called uh, Indie Web that's been around for a decade or, or so. Um, it's, it's actually really cool. The idea is that instead of big silos uh, like Facebook or, or X or whatever, um, you, you do stuff on the web um, in your own space, uh, on your own domain, and then, um, and then syndicate it out to other parts of, of the, the web. Uh, so uh, it's a small movement. Um, they never gained a lot of traction. They've got some really cool stuff, and it it's good at decentralization. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, uh, the intercommunity stuff, uh, the, one of the headlines we came up with for it this week was decentralized coordination. Um, uh, there's somehow where, you know, it's, it's hard, to, uh, hard to coordinate in a decentralized way. Like, how do you find people? How do you find the right people? How do you tell people stuff? So in a way that the indie web and intercommunity stuff has, is, uh, resonates, uh, harmonizes. So anyway, Indie Web Community um, is having their first uh, in-person meeting uh, since the pandemic started, and it happens to be in San Diego. So I'm going to go. I'm super excited. Um, uh, it's about. It's going to be like around ten people or so. It's not a big thing, uh, but I'll get to see Chris Aldrich there, um, and uh, probably Jack Park, and some of the other folks that I've kind of heard of and you know know a little bit of. So that's pretty exciting. Um, um, my main stuff is working on some AI things, um, having some fun with GPTs and uh, lots of image generation and AI art with Midjourney, and trying to figure out how marketplaces uh, for both people producing AI content and then um, people who might be able to consume uh, AI generated content might work. Um, uh, I'm surprised it's, it's seemed, we have, uh, 
I don't know. We have places where it seems to be a lot of mismatch between how we think of uh, creating stuff and how we consume stuff and who can do it and who can't and what's professional mean. And, um, and uh, it seems like a lot of marketplace opportunities, I guess, so that I, I'm doing the, the pitch backwards. If I do the pitch forwards, it's, uh, let me let me try it on for size real quick. Um, uh, new AI tools uh, can do um, help you do help people do help humans do art and writing and thinking and being creative. Uh, and these tools uh, unlock or democratize the power of creation for um, people who who uh, it wasn't available to before. So. We have this idea of, for whatever reason, we had, had this idea, oh, great, uh, ChatGPT is here. We can make it do its homework and I can, do, I, I can do my work and I don't have to do any work. And that's totally the wrong way to look at AI. Um, AI is, I, I was uh, talking to my wife this morning, AI is kind of like a, a piano. It sounds really pretty. You know, it sounds better than banging rocks together or sticks together. Um, and you can, you know, make any note you want um, as long as it's on the chromatic scale and, and uh, as long as, um, you know, as long as it's a piano sound and not a, a guitar sound or whatever. But that doesn't mean that it makes the music for you. It makes a sound for you. It doesn't make music. So humans still are the things that, that make creative music. So AI tools kind of unlock the ability to, to be creative in a new way. Um, they don't complete the art. They get you started with it, um, the art or the, you know, the, the work or work of writing or whatever. Um, and they, they help you do a lot better. So in, an, in this world, we've got this democratized ability to do a lot more creative stuff um, for humans. And that means that the places where we've had professionals doing image creation or text writing, um, more people can participate and more people can participate in smaller slivers of it. Um, so little parts of it, um, can get done by more people more effectively. So then if you have lots of people, you know, writing stuff or lots of people generating art um, and maybe in little niche parts of it, um, there needs to be a marketplace to tie all that together. So I'm excited about that marketplace. Um, and uh, that's what I'm interested in doing next year. So that's me. Jesse, it sounds like you're up. That is my last name. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. So I love what you're talking about in terms of, can you hear me just fine? Or want to double check? Okay. Uh, Inter-community. <clears throat> what, you know, what really angers me, <laughs> and you know you're in the right space when you're working on something if it's really angry, um, that there's this, just a duplicate of efforts and trying to find a way to um, reduce that duplicate. Duplication is, is something I'm always looking at. And so I guess the first thing I'd like to say for a check-in is I'm, you know, the world agreed to move away from fossil fuels at Dubai. So the yay on that. Um, but there was this one interesting video that someone shared. I think it was Trey. Judith, you were on the call. Is it Trey that shared? Yeah, I think um, that's worth sharing. I'll put it in the chat just to drop it in there. It's funny and it's truth. It is. Um, <laughs> uh, but I won't go into it. We, we can do that later if we wanted to. <laughs> but in my own little small world, and what Judy, Judy has already heard <clears throat> just yesterday on a call, is it feels like it's just too big to be able to work on something. So I've chosen food, as um, some of you already know, food security as a way to um, approach what's um, what can be better in this world. <laughs> And it, because food industry touches so many parts of the system. So talk about connecting people and data and resources uh, to support food security. Um, so I do have this way of trying to start something, this form, I'll put it in chat and <clears throat> somehow it's going to move into um, a, some kind of kumu. I don't know what it is, but I am meeting with Vincent today to discuss how this data can be 
um, visualized. But um, more simply, I, I'm almost done finishing the app development for Plant Powered Foodie. And it's all about putting more plants on your plate. And not only that, but enjoying enjoying it, enjoying those plants. So I don't know if that was a pitch backwards or a pitch forward, but that's my story. Thank you. That's lovely. Uh, thanks, Jesse. Really appreciate that. Um, and another video to watch. Excellent. This uh, we have one of the things I like about mycelia or mushrooms as a metaphor is that mycelia externalize their digestive process. I think I don't, and I'm not a biologist. So I'm probably saying this all wrong, but you know, uh, humans and other animals have stomachs. They they have acids and so forth in their stomachs, stomachs and bacteria, and they ingest things. Um, mycelia basically excrete acids and other substances that melt things like rocks and minerals and so forth that they can then metabolize. And it's it's uh, really interesting. And I feel, and one of the reasons why I love mycelia as metaphor is that I'm trying to imagine what it looks like for us to, to externalize our digestion of media and materials and yet make it available and understandable for each other. How do we, how do we, and maybe that's too gross a metaphor for trying to trying to process information, uh, but but how do we process all of this together so that it's trustworthy and findable and connected and relatable and all those kinds of things? So hence my love of the big fungus as a metaphor overall for this thing. Um, cool. It sounds like there was some resonance in our check-ins, maybe because we all kind of follow ourselves, but about like what our purpose is and where our energy is headed, uh, things of that nature. Uh, but I'm open to talking about whatever, and Pete's got his hand up. Thanks, Jerry. Um, triggered triggered a little bit by you saying that uh, mycelial networks have externalized their digestive system. Um, there's a interesting article in Nature that maybe humans did the same thing. Um, uh, by, by cooking? Uh, by fermentation, actually. Oh, fermentation. Got it. And they talk about how you don't have to know fermentation technology to start using fermentation. If you just cache some food in a, you know, in a dark, dark uh, humid place, it's going to ferment. Um, but if you do that enough, if you kind of get the hang of it, um, uh, you're breaking down your food um, faster so you can move some of your metabolic energy um, uh, investments from your gut to your brain. So that's the, the story. It's, it's an interesting story. Thank you. Anyone else want to take this wherever you'd like? I came across yesterday um, an, uh, an experiment where um, there, someone, some, co some group is growing uh, brain cells um, and then merging them with, uh, uh, with, with a computer. Um, so, so to use a, a, a real human brain cells grown in a lab uh, to combine those with a computer now, that gets pretty sketchy, uh, uh, that kind of research. Yeah. There's certainly ethical boundaries for all these kinds of things that are need to be explored real soon now. I agree, and it's frustrating that there doesn't seem to be any central body or even distributed body that addresses ethics across multiple arenas. And the arenas are all sort of blending together. Hey, Bill, we just did a quick round of check-ins. If you'd like to, uh, please do. And we're finding our way toward a topic for the rest of the call. OK, well, so just sorry to be late. Um, so just what, uh, what Judith just said, I've just finished reading Wendy Brown's little book of uh, talks she gave Yale lectures called Nihilistic which, Times. Which, thinking Pete, with, which Pete mentioned a moment ago when he checked in. Yeah, well, I just finished it. And the thing that's, I'm going to have to read this again. It's one of the more difficult books I've read, mostly because she's such a careful political scientist and philosopher. The language, <laughs> yeah, I had to look a lot of words up. Um, but the argument is that uh, that Max Weber at the end of his life, but he really saw it when he was, you know, at the end of the 18th century and, and or the 19th century and stuff. It was just like 
um, the displacement of authority from religion into science, and then the whole kind of building up of the bureaucracies in these large other systems. He said, what we really need, what people need is to separate, this is a, I don't really completely understand it, but basically separate intellectual academic work as to really understanding what values are, how do we create values, all these things from the realm in which we actually put them into practice, which he called politics. Um, and so at the end, uh, basically, I mean, she does a really good critique because she says Weber basically was such a, he tried to make academics so pure that it really, it has led to what we have now, which is like the over -polit politicalization of academia, which was on display just in Congress last week with these, you know, underprepared university presidents. So it's more like what, what we really need now is to really build a moat between academia and politics, one that actually allows us to examine what we what we know, how we know it, all these things. And then secondly, understand how maybe to put that into practice in politics, but without um without just reducing in a, you know some intellectual uh, study of say values or the your morality be able to study that and then also then be able to talk about well what kind of morals do we want to live by and how are we going to do that this, this, I mean I, I have to read this again it's a very kind of but that's the basic story and she says the real thing we really need need to do which struck me was, the reason one needs to study philosophy, humanities, literature, arts, is actually to develop ways to actually understand how to think about things or invent new ways to think about things or even talk about how we think about how we think about things so we could actually do it better. And then there is the realm in which we actually have to organize ourselves socially and, you know, like accomplish, oh, let's live by laws. All right, let's make that work which is, you know, something different. Anyway, so. Bill, thank you. What what little I know about the book, which I've not read, is that it's based a lot on Weber's vocation lectures. And he wrote, he gave a, he gave a lecture in 1917, just mid, mid World War I, science as a vocation. And then a second uh, lecture in 1919, politics as a vocation. And I know yeah. almost nothing about them. Can you, can you describe them a little bit? Or, or is there something else you can light up for us about what, what he was thinking? Or Because that, that's a crazy time in history. It's like World War II is a crazy war. The end of World War II is a terrible time for the world because a lot of stupid stuff happened right then. Um, can you say more? No, I, really, well, very, I just really do not. I'm, I'm, I have the same. This is my first introduction to those two works by Weber is from her basically lectures on them. And uh -huh. she says she uses them in teaching, but mostly because he tried to make the point about what is it about politics? And this is where we actually determine amongst ourselves as a society what we think is important and how we actually put what's important into practice. And this science is what science was more like a shorthand for into academic and intellectual study of, you know, domains, including, you know, morality or whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, it, and it sounds like the lectures were highly influential and shaped a lot of how we think about and how we do those things. She said that, the, well, he, he actually sort of was trying to struggle with his own issues, right? I mean, you know, the quote from uh, Ionesco, you know, God is dead, Box is dead, and I'm not feeling so good myself. So, <laughs> um. But he was really struggling with now that, you know, authority, which used to be institutionalized in religion and traditions, was displaced by authority in terms of science. Here's how we know things. So truth is, you know, became much more uh, contested. And we had developed, you know, capitalism had started to develop mechanisms for how do we, you know, just do our thing. And he was sort of trying to figure out how do we actually get back to a place where we can actually have 
places to study, think about things, and also, you know, just not have the two two. It be, it's not one thing. He said there are two basically two things going on here: studying academics, learning, thinking, and then putting it to practice socially. And they need there needs to be some separation between them. And I, I'm sorry, Peter, I just want to go off on one more second. It feels like in some corners of the world, and certainly not a majority of the population, there is a tremendous appetite for the conversation you're putting in front of us, for doing more about that, thinking more about that, bringing back critical thinking, building better citizens and citizenship and all those kinds of things. Like there's a lot of appetite for that, which I like. Well, so the last thing in the, the afterward to the book, she said, this is what we need to, or, well, she's an educator, right? So, but she says, this is what we need to be doing in, in, you know, academic and in education is, you know, because he, she said, young people, she says, they're not immune to the fact that they are being forced into like, you got to get a job and you got to have skills and you got to have a CB and you got to be on LinkedIn with, oh my God, the climate's falling apart. You know, she goes, we need to help them, you know, as best we can learn how to work with these questions. And also, so that's more of, I think, what I thought I thought, found the effort quite powerful because she says, you know, the problem with STEM education is it's all about being instrumental. That, Which, you know, Klaus, yeah. you said, you know, so there's one thing about making, you know, seeing what we've done to soils and agriculture and all this stuff. And there's one piece about, well, we could be technical about it, but we also need to, as you, you have pointed out many times, well, there's like a, and I appeal it too, there's a basic morality here in how we are living and, you know, taking care of basically ourselves and our whole world. So she says that the appetite is really available. You know, she goes, young people, they have it. I mean, they're living it right now. Right, because I'm not going to be alive in 2050. You know, but my son will, Likewise. my grandkids will. So I mean, yeah. one, yeah, if, you know, if they live that long, but whatever, you know. So anyway, I just I think it's a really important conversation to be had, and uh, you know, those I would call those three presidents hapless, except for the fact that their institutions have a ton of money. And they were so ill prepared to walk into Congress. I don't know what they thought they were walking into. Mm -hmm. A thesis, a thesis defense? Like, no. <laughs> you know, so so I think that just shows how, you know, we really need to work at mostly, you know, separating learning how to think and also learning how to, you know, and getting things done without, I don't know. Her take is Weber tried to make it really antiseptic. And if you're going to be an academic, you basically can't have any opinions or values. Or it was like, she goes, yeah, well, great. there was a lot. Of, there was a lot of that going on at the time. A lot of people, um, Franz Boas did that to anthropology. Like there, there's a whole bunch of take yourself out of the equation, make this as objective, of, you know, objectivity through all of science and all that. And it screwed up a lot of things because the scientist inevitably is entwined with the work. Um, let me, she let me said go. it was. She said it one bill. She just said it was worse because yeah. Weber just set this thing up to be like you know completely puritan and antiseptic. And what did that did? It let the door open to where we are now. Love that. Um, thanks, Bill. That's awesome. Um, Pete, Klaus, Judy. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Bill. Um, I really like uh, the the visual metaphor or whatever of a moat between academics and politics. Um, and um, I just wanted to kind of like the, the thing that happened with the university presidents and, and uh, representative Stefanik, I thought was, it was, is one of those, you know, defining moments kind of um, where, where I, I don't think anybody really enjoyed it but you can see that the world kind of changed uh, another notch. And, and I think a lot of people went, great, that's a good notch to have moved over. But if you pull back a little bit, you go, it wasn't good for anybody. You know, it's not good for free speech. It's not good for decision-making. It's not good for 
um, uh, for politics or academia, you know, all it does is it moves academia more into the position of politics. I, I talked a little bit with about this with Bill and a little bit about it with my wife and politics is actually kind of out of my depth. So I don't, I apologize if I get anything wrong, but the, um, uh, you know, um, one of the questions my wife has is like, so why weren't these university presidents just human? You know, if somebody says, you know, when somebody says they're calling for genocide, won't you say, I have bored genocide, you know, anywhere it happens. So that's obviously a bad thing. They couldn't say that. And she's like, well, if, you know, if I were a human and I were sitting in a chair that I would have been able to say that. And I'm like, well, you know, the reason that they're sitting in that chair, the reason they're sitting in their president's chair, not the, not the con congressional chair, the reason they're sitting in that chair is because they've been able to turn themselves into a particular kind of robot at certain, in certain venues, right? So when they're in an academic, you know, discrimination, you know, administration discussion, they have a canned set of responses, which they, they spool out, right? So they don't say the, the human thing, like, you know, genocide makes me sick to my stomach. They say something else more nuanced and sad that goes along with the guidelines, right? So it was a really interesting, and, and another question is, these are essentially CEOs of like, you know, billion dollar corporations or whatever, how could they have gone to Congress and not been prepared <laughs> for, you know, and it's they like, it was a, it Just was wrong. It was a cleverly constructed trap that Stefanik sprung. Um, you know, it wasn't, she was, she wasn't being particularly clever. Um, I don't think, um, she was effective at being a bear trap. Um, but I'm pretty sure she got coached into why that bear trap, how that bear trap works. Um, what to do to, you know, when to spring the bear trap, all that kind of stuff, right? It's levels of political machination way above a Stefanik's pay grade. She was just the, you know, the sharp instrument at the, at the coal face. So the, the whole thing is really fascinating to watch, you know, and, and so now that three, three university presidents like right in a row stepped in the bear trap and got their leg, you know, not off. It's like, okay, well, so now academia has to learn that, you know, that trap and to route around that now, which ultimately does nobody uh, any good. And it's just sad to, to see it happen, play out that way. It's just, and fascinating, fascinating in a macabre and, and gut-wrenching way. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah. So Pete uh, inadvertently maybe um, uh, mentions the the uh, manipulation that's that's in the system right uh, because Stefanik if you say that uh, that information really comes from someone else coaching her or a group of people coaching her that really reveals the entire machinations that's are in, that are in place uh, uh, you know behind the scene not so much behind the scene anymore when you look at the heritage foundation and uh, liberty groups and so on and so on it's just it's just blatant right but the what what really struck me out of the cop 28 is the uh um on the one hand the realization that western industrialized nations have to reduce their consumption patterns. There's just no way around it. You know? I mean, we're just we're just depleting the planet of resources in, with our lifestyle, uh, and the absolute resistance to do that. So, so the the um, I mean, the Biden administration sort of you know is floundering right now with this uh, with this uh, um, transition. I mean, when you think about electric cars, for example, you know, Ford just halved their most popular electric model, the, the, the 150 truck, right? They just cut the production line in half because they can't sell it. Um, they are, there is one year of supply of electric cars on car lots. So what that implies is that the, 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 the market is just not receptive enough. Um, and then you have, you don't have enough charging stations, there's not enough infrastructure in place, you know, there's no coordinated training program, 
for mechanics and, and you know repair shops and all of this that would be able to deal with this massive influx of a new technology into the economy. Right? So so you so it's not coordinated because the whole system is fighting every step of the way. I mean, people who own gas stations, they don't want to you know, all of a sudden uh, 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 shift into electric. You know, they're not geared up for it. And yet the same is true for repair shops. And so the entire infrastructure is 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 corning because there is no consensus, right? There's no national consensus on uh, we need to do this. Uh, and so... Um, the the uh, no, I mean I I see it in the food business and when you when you look at the most promising group of people should really be teenagers you know and young adults you know college kids and so on they're clueless I mean the information doesn't penetrate uh, into that group you know? they could actually create a counter revolution if they just with their buying behavior you know, just by uh, shifting their their uh, consumption patterns but they're not doing it it's just uh, it hasn't it hasn't sunk in so there is it's it's uh, uh it's just extremely difficult you know, to create uh, a form of coordinated action which has to start with a common story right we need a story that everybody buys into and and embraces and then acts on uh, so, um, I mean, right now, I, I, I was reading Colorado that, that Trump is just soaring, you know, to in in the polls. And I mean, it's not that people care for the guy, or they may they may actually despise him because he's such a revolting individual. But it's a form of protest. You know? It's a form of we hate what's going on here, um, and. Uh, uh, which is which is mad, you know. So we want to blow this thing up because it's going in places we don't like, and that's basically because people have co haven't come to to accept, you know. I mean, my God, my 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 son is flying to Colorado this weekend uh, to go skiing. His girlfriend just came back from Miami last week uh, the, for some art show, you, you know. I, I mean, they're like constantly. Uh, th th those people who have the money are consuming like there's no tomorrow. It's just incredible. And even my own kids, you know, where they know what their dad is up to and, and, and it doesn't, I mean, that's just, you know, so yeah, I don't know how, how, how we, how we can shake that up. And the, the, the unfortunate thing of course is uh, the parallel would be uh, the United States uh, before entering World War II, and when you when you look at this one year before Pearl Harbor, right, it was massive confusion. You had a neo-Nazi, you had neo-Nazis out in the street. Uh, it wasn't neo at the time; there were Nazis, you know, in the street protesting, marching. You know, you had a communist party that was active. I mean, it was just. A, a, a pandemonium because the economy was in the tank also. And it wasn't until Pearl Harbor that became a unifying force you know, that, that uh, consolidated the national energy. But the problem is if we have a Pearl Harbor event caused by climate change, it's basically game over, you know, uh, mm -hmm. because now you, now you have uh, past irreversible tipping points and you can't put the ice back onto the, onto the glacier, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm rambling. Um, Klaus, no, thank you. Just just your brief sentence up front, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but supporting Trump as a form of protest was like nice and totally crisp and clear and, and something I hadn't put in such few words. So thank you for that and everything else you said. All right, go ahead, Judy. I'm trying to avoid getting depressed. Oh. <laughs> um, the, the piece that that bothers me all of the time is the presumption that people think similarly or behave similarly given circumstances. And we are such a spectrum of humanity in terms of inherent capacity, experienced capacity, 
you know, what percentage of the population even gets to higher level education? How do we reach people who aren't in higher education if we presume that we need fairly sophisticated philosophy to reach people? That doesn't seem like a successful approach. And so I get sort of frustrated with how to do something that will have impact or how to change the system in some way to invite a different type of engagement. Because there's a difference between what I perceive societally as a predominance of behavior in people in self-interested behaviors. We even see it in generational changes from the baby boomers to the Gen Xers and less participation in any form of volunteerism by the Gen Xers. And in order for the kind of change to occur that would be needed to correct many of these things, we have to reach a lot more people than our current ways of reaching people go. And that might be something for us to think about where there are, where there are pressure points that could be successfully leveraged that would actually reach people individually. I mean, do we want the people in the street approach because that does engage people, but then what will they be hearing or engaging in that might influence them to think about something differently or to actually change a behavior? And so there's sort of social psychology, there's intellectualism, there's discernment. And so many of our friends and neighbors are even in the intellectual categories of people, which this group pretty much is, we have different capacities for change, different capacities for incorporating new information. And a lot of these topics, I don't even bring up in sort of typical neighborhood gatherings because I haven't figured out how to do it. So I, I'm, I'm not feeling very constructive here, but I'm sort of trying to raise an issue that is really frightening for me because if the people who have discernment become so discouraged that they give up, the game is over. <laughs> um, and that's not where I'd like to see us all go. And the depletion of the planet is something that's so massive in scope that you can't really leave it to the legislators or the politicians or even the educators to invite the shifts in behavior that would need to occur. I'll stop because otherwise I'll get sad. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. I, I'm sorry you're sad, and I'm very much noting the sort of the anger and desperation and exhaustion of a lot of people who care about these issues, and that scares me as well. And maybe we, maybe we can go into silence just for a little bit to, to sit with what the last couple of people have, have added to the conversation. I'll I'll bring us back out and then go to Bill. Apparently, it only takes 10 slow, deep breaths to kind of reset your vagus system or your autonomous nervous system, or I don't know which system resets, but 10, 10 slow, deep breaths usually helps a bunch, um, which is usually a couple minutes worth of breathing. Um, go ahead, Bill. Uh, you're muted. First time on Zoom. Totally get it. Um, well, that's really interesting about 10 breaths in the vagus nerve because uh, from my experience when I was uh, a Zen practitioner, the first Zen meditation practices is to count your breaths to 10 and start over again. 
And if you find, oh, I already got the three. I don't know what I'm thinking about. You just go back to one. Right. You restart. Yeah. As my teacher once said, she, he said, it's the easiest practice. To, all you have to do is when you're not paying attention, pay attention again. <laughs> it's like, it's not very complicated. He said it's not easy, but it's not very complicated. <laughs> so, um, well, Tuthi, I want to follow up on what Pete said, his wife said, uh, what my wife said, in addition to these presidents, like, you know, they talked to the lawyers, but they didn't talk to the PR people. It's like, you know, you're going to Congress, like, you know, it's not the faculty Senate here, whatever. Um, but the other thing is, and, you know, she's an academic as well as I've been. And she said, I think that some of these people, and Klaus, you mentioned this a little they don't really, they're not, they, they think, oh, this is Congress. These people don't really know anything. I can deal with this. Like they have no idea what they're walking into. I can deal with somebody who can't think well. I think well. It's like, you know, I don't know what you think you're walking into. You know, this is not a, this is not a, you know, this is not a think off here. So there is a little bit of, uh, you know, Um, the feeling that, uh, you know, smart people are just, you know, well, I'm smart, therefore, you know, I can, I'm just smarter. And I, I learned a long time ago that, you know, regardless of what I've read, I'm not that, I'm not that smart. <clears throat> um, but the thing that Judith said, I was a, there was a teacher in high school for a, a brief semester, I was hired to take over from a science teacher that everyone loved who had to leave because he couldn't afford to, what they were paying. So, you know, I started off in the, <laughs> on the downside. But one of the things I found then when I was trying to teach like ninth graders, general science, maybe because I was still you know, idealistic and just out of graduate school. I'm like, yeah, I know, like, I know things. Um, I just, there was a lot of questions that they would ask that I would just say, huh, that's a decent question. Let's talk about that. Rather than trying to be didactic and saying, here's the material. And I think, I mean, Klaus, I think this is true because you started, you know, you said you started to work with some people in the community and people who are actually trying to get things done do have questions. And sometimes they can feel... You know, I mean, I've had some neighbors that just, they were just intimidated because I had a graduate degree. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, you know more about tending a garden than I do about anything. So, but, so I, th I think we're in, a, we could touch people if we could be in situations where it's okay to ask whatever questions or like Pete said, right? If somebody says, you know, about genocide, you just, just say what you think or if you're you know if you're frightened just say yeah it scares me too maybe we should talk about that because i do think i was wendy brown made a point about young people i said it early but it really strikes me being in a system that they need to be in in order to make a living to get ahead and still trying to squash this kind of questions and uncertainty and fear they have about how viable is this system they're asked to participate in. And so, I mean, her take is like, that's what she'd be asking those questions with those people. And part of what we could be doing in school, even with younger people, is learning how to ask questions about things. And it's okay to ask questions. Um, yeah, I don't know, but I think we can, there, there is a way because, I mean, you know, one reason I read murder mysteries is so I don't have to think about other things. So <laughs> that could be like going to the latest concert as well. So, I mean, um, I think there is, there are ways and I think maybe it's going to happen amongst in small groups, you know, and 
And the setups can be weird. Let's all get together and talk about something. So you walk into the room, you might not feel, I'm like, I wonder what this is about. You're not really, I mean, I'm kind of a shy person sometimes, so I'm not going to raise my hand. So it's really weird because we're acculturated to be, you know, like the classroom scene is a weird, the whole thing is a weird scene. <laughs> the raising of the hand to speak sort of thing too. Yeah, that that could be. You could do that in a group just because it every it works for everyone, yeah. right? And nobody jumps over somebody else, and so. But yes, um, it's a. I, I did um. I, I, I'm rambling too, but maybe this is just you. I've got I've got the rambles this morning. So. That's all right. Um, I attended Quaker meeting in Connecticut, which is where I fell in love with Quakerism. And one day, I attended another meeting at a local bookstore. That was about a Quaker meeting with a, a, an intent for business. I think it's called. God, there's a there's a different way of saying it. Um, and during his introduction, the guy who was basically talking to us about this um, asked us a question. I think Pete and a couple of you might have heard me say this, tell this anecdote before. But he asked us a question, and then he said, "Why don't we go into silence for a few minutes to sort of think about the question?" And I think I was like 30, 35, somewhere in there, that age. And I'm like, "Fuck! How did I get to 35 years old and nobody ever? Everybody was always like, oh, oh, oh! I got the like. It was like first to answer was was the win, <clears throat> right? And and how did I get to be this old and nobody ever said, let's take a while." and and get to a better answer he, he didn't even say that he just said let's let's just be silent with this for a little bit and then and then talk about it it was wonderful so uh jesse please yeah thank you <clears throat> i wish i want i i found things way earlier in life too terry <laughs> i would have changed the path mm. but hey you know it is what it is <laughs> isn't that a lovely saying so Judith, I, when you said um, people, when you referred to people giving up, that, that really did strike something in me. And I know that as I see it, people give up because they, they're putting in effort and it didn't create a result. I mean, they put in a lot of effort actually. And over time it didn't create a result and it didn't create a result and it didn't create a result. And sooner or later you just put your, your hands up and I'm just, when I start, it's interesting that we have a Zen master in our, our, our house right here, but when creating an environment that's conducive to compassion, not only for the self, but for others, I think it really does come down to, um, there's a lot of efforting going on. Therefore, a lot of failed expectations. Therefore, a lot of you know, sadness. And in the Buddhism um, world, there's something called um, which seeds are you watering? And when you're having a certain feeling, it's just a it's just a question saying, what seeds are you watering? Or when, when people are giving up, <clears throat> what seeds are they watering? And I just, I, I come back to that over and over again. And I just wanted to share it. Thanks. So to go a little bit back to the dark stuff that Judy was pointing to, I keep seeing the train just barreling down the tracks toward an undesirable outcome. And I keep wondering, what do we put on the rails? Or what do we do to this thing to derail it? Or how do we diffuse it? Or in a spirit of Aikido, how do we blend with the energy and and, and neutralize its, its negative or harmful effects while accepting that there's this really, in Aikido, there's this really interesting thing once you get into it about the, the, the quality of connection between uke and nage. The two roles are uke and nage, the attacker and the receiver, or the, the receiver is the one who pins or throws the, the attacker. 
and there's this quality of connection thing where you're both communicating with every every sort of gesture and every every moment of contact. It's not meant to be a blow and a parry, which is other sports. It's meant to be a weight and a sense of ha of your 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 hara and your your presence and where your energy is coming from. All that stuff is at play in the middle of it, and it's super interesting because so much of it is a, a, a sense of communication and respect for your opponent because you're trying not to kill your opponent. And our, our my favorite of our teachers, who's quite martial and love, does a whole bunch of other things like knife sports and so forth, knife fighting. Um, he always like, you know, in other, in other sports we would do this, but we're Aikidoists. So we're looking to neutralize or, or be peaceful about this. And he will, he will show the variance. He'd be like, there's four opportunities to kill your opponent here. We're not, we don't do that. We do this instead. It's really, really interesting. Um, and I, and sorry, I think I've got the rambles too. I think it's contagious, Bill. Um, but uh, I'm wondering, as we sit here, I feel like we're in the crowd uh, with much better free global telecommunications. We're in the crowd in 1938, 34 to 38, you know, uh, I hate to bring up Hitler, but rise of Hitler and watching different things happen um, that unfold. And, and, you know, Trump's statement a couple of days ago of, I, you know, I, I won't be a dictator except on day one was quite chilling and quite intentional. I think it was extremely intentional. Um, Klaus, go ahead. Yeah, I think we we are um, in a in a space right now that is... Um, that's both good and bad, right? Because Trump has become like depolarizing uh, uh, figure, um, and and he he is sort of he has literally consolidated power because with Mike Johnson in the House, um, I mean Mike Johnson had no intention of uh, 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 pursuing this Biden uh, impeachment until he went to Mar-a-Lago. And came back and had uh, new marching orders. So Trump actually uh, uh, influences, you know, the congressional actions, uh, which is just like completely out of out of. Uh, 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 I mean, blows your mind. Um, I mean, there is you know there is speculation that uh, this whole thing holding up Ukraine aid and so on has something to do with wanting. To pull back on, on on the criminal trials for Trump, but conversely, if you take this guy out, you're completely resetting the clock. So the the only real uh, chance we have for any sense of normalcy in pursuing, you know, the nation's path towards a uh, towards a collective future that actually deals with the issues we have. Is to take this guy out, you know, and just you know you can't run. I mean, have the Supreme Court make this ruling that uh, um, you're not immune, and uh, and have uh, other states like uh, I think it's Colorado uh, succeed in banning him from uh, uh, being on the ballot, right? The, the Article Four is it uh, the, the Article Fourteen in the Constitution, right? Invoke that. And be done with it, right? And just make a make a firm statement. You're done with it. Then the Republican Party focus is forced to refocus itself to a different leader, um, and uh, and that gives you no know, breathing space you know, to the Democratic you know, Party, Biden, or whoever wants to succeed there. So, uh, is you can change the conversation, but for as long as this guy is running. Uh, and the way this is pushing forward right now, um, the political process is completely captivated. And it's, I mean, COP28 made it clear that this is not just an American issue, this is a global issue, right? I mean, the power that, I mean, look at the, the power that Saudi Arabia has in this whole thing. Uh, Russia is in this thing because the oil producing uh, 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 nations have absolutely no intention of backing off. I mean, that became very clear. So when you look at the the, me the, the mechanics of uh, you know, all these moving parts, there, the, uh, you know, if we do, if if the the legal system uh, can't muster the backbone and the integrity 
uh, and the and the uh, uh, and honor you know their role to the nation, um, then we're screwed. <laughs> you know, it's as simple as that. Pete just posted uh, Robert Kagan's article in the post about being, dictatorship is increasingly inevitable, which was really pretty scary and keeps coming up. That that's that article is going to have legs through the election. And the insanity of this, I mean, Hitler basically came into power with very similar uh, dynamics, right? Because Germany at the time uh, was in, in dire straits, um, the the allies, I mean, the the, the World War One's uh, uh, winners had overstretched, uh, not the the uh, 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 their their uh, uh, success and uh, dominated um, German politics, humiliated the nation. You now, I, I, I mean, it was just, I mean, I, I I got some, I mean, incredible stories about. You know the arrogance of French occupied occupants and so on, how they behaved in, in all this stuff. So, so that was just the the anger in the population. You know, was just palpable. And then you had the industrialists, you know, who who wanted to have a guy who is basically clearing out the obstacles and just let's just move. And they thought they can control this guy. And you can't. I mean, Trump, you can't control Trump. The guy is, is uh, insane. I mean, you don't know where he's going to go. You know, and the idea that you can put constraints on him is just naive. You know? um, but the the I, I think they have now created this complete recklessness. You know, where uh, the desire to to uh, hang on to status quo and to to privileges and shape uh, the future in their vision uh, is just so powerful that they don't really care. There are a lot of mistakes and misjudgments and miscalculations made. Um, between World War I and World War II, Germany was forced to pay incredible reparations. British foreign policy was, we never want there to be one dominant power on the continent because they always try to invade us. And at the end of World War I, the dominant power was France. And it was really strong and it looked really like it was going to get stronger. And so whatever reparations Germany repaid after World War I were financed by Britain. And the British were busy underestimating Hitler and thinking this joker, you know, this joker could never win control until he had control and until it was too late. And then we have uh, Clement Datley and appeasement and a whole bunch of stuff. So, so the British were busy like screwing this thing up every which way till Sunday, right, you know, right up until they're busy fighting for their lives in the Battle of Britain. And, and but, but, but oh, I'm really interested in all the things that might have avoided huge calamities. You know, we're, we're, uh, the Vietnam War was eminently avoidable. Some of you heard me say this before too. Ho Chi Minh, the famous Ho Chi Minh, wrote letters to President Woodrow Wilson after World War I and to Truman after World War II, pretty much the same letter. And he said, in close, please find a draft constitution for a democratic republic of Vietnam. Could you please help me get rid of the French? Roosevelt was a fan of Ho Chi Minh's and probably would have said yes. Truman was the opposite and said no. And we, in both cases, we didn't reply to Ho Chi Minh. So instead, the Vietnamese fought a multi-year war get, to get rid of the French. We then tapped the French out and said, oh, let us take your place, because we had a faulty idea about the domino theory. And that ate a whole bunch of treasure, lives, and goodwill around the world. And, and, and like it's humans making stupid judgments over and over and over that affect enormous numbers of humans because now we have weapons that are that big and politics and countries that are that big and the game is, is suddenly very large. Before we had standing armies, it was hard to marshal everybody else, everybody to send their sons and you know give up their crops and all that, risk starvation in order to go fight a war someplace else.
Yeah, so you know, that was not that was not more uplifting. Sorry, go ahead, Bill. No, so it was really interesting. So I've heard this, and I kind of believe it in the story of the domino theory. And so I'm just thinking off the top of my head here. Um, I wonder if that was just an idea people used to rationalize how they could behave the way they wanted to behave, rather than actually having some theoretical, thought based you know, theory here. You know, I mean, because I think this just gets, you know, well, if Weber's right, and we should use the academia to really think about things, maybe we should be thinking about these things. You know, I mean, using our thinking tools, the gray cells for that. And uh, so I, I just wonder, um, and in, you know, that just could be like, well, let's just, you know, get over it, Bill. But I've just been trying to tickle my own mind with trying to question things that I find I don't ever question. I mean, Klaus, there's something came up in, in your writings about the, the, uh, the, the soil, but in the water cycle, it made me go back and look at some of the climate science and models. And you posted that link with all these, these studies. And, you know, I've read basically, the, well, whatever that Yahoo list, it was six or eight papers. So I read, looked at most of them and trying to make sense out of well what is the issue you know um so that was really helpful i really appreciate that um there was really a comment i saw somewhere or maybe it was doug c who said you know well, the problem with climate models is they just you know they're terrible at predicting intensity of rainstorms well it's been true for forever Climate models have been, you know, they've gotten better and better and better. This just happened when, oh, I can't remember the name of the storm that that flooded Houston a few years ago, but that hurricane that came and decided to sit on, sit offshore. You know, they knew exactly where it was going and said, you know, hurricane people, we can, yeah, we can predict, you know, the paths pretty well now. In fact, very well. You know, five days out and it's still... So what we can't predict is the intensity. So it's not like the climate scientists don't know they can't predict it. They do know that the models don't allow them to, because intensity apparently is uh, a lot more harder. There's a harder problem Actually, than the physics. The physics of a the physics of a storm, you know, in a motion. Lot more dynamic. Yeah, and there's I think there's more pieces to it. Just more more you know physics chemistry going on and it may be a little chaotic in a way so it's not you know equations of motion you know the kind of like here's the deal <laughs> you know um so um i just wanted to thank you klaus for that because they helped me really think through some of what the issues are about how you know the focus on carbon dioxide takes away from actually thinking about other opportunities for action that can be taken so um but i did read a bunch of papers where people said well you know water vapor is the most potent greenhouse gas so you know it's like so much more potent than carbon dioxide we don't really have to worry about carbon dioxide so i did a little you know chemistry and physics reading about that and so that's wrong <laughs> You know, because water, yeah, it's a vapor, but it turns into droplets and it comes back down. Whereas carbon dioxide is a gas, it stays a gas. <laughs> it's always a gas, mm -hmm. you know. So there is a some interesting, for me, it was a more nuanced way to try and think about how we, you know, are critical of the, the things we take for granted when we think about things and, you know, how to poke at them. I have a practical question that springs out of what Bill was just saying, because you reminded me that I'm in a, I'm in a new conversation with a friend I made maybe a year ago, who's a local entrepreneur who's run a couple smallish companies, uh, is more conservative than me, but doesn't call himself a Republican or far out, hate, hates Trump, and has some really interesting critiques uh, of the current system. His name is Scott Grout. There he is in my brain, so you can see what he's connected to if you want to. And... Uh, many mornings I will wake up to 
four or five emails with articles and commentary, and he and I are kind of in a, in a conversation that's overwhelming to me. So I respond a little bit and I apologize. And it's actually very nice. Um, and one of his biggest tropes is about performative progressives, which I can go into if you're curious. But I was trying to figure out how to get him involved in OGM because he's definitely got a, a different opinion from a lot of OGMers. And I think that healthy dialogue and our ability to sort of address these things would be improved by his presence. But his posts are numerous enough that they would overwhelm the OGM list. So I just he just opened an account yesterday on the Mattermost server. And I think what I want to do is open up a new channel on Mattermost. I'm not sure what to call it. Uh, politics, uh, saving the world. Uh, I don't know what else, I, I, but I think, but I think Mattermost might be a really good place. And if he were to post the same number of articles into a channel on Mattermost that anybody could opt into who wanted to, I think there we could sort of scroll up and down and see what the history of the conversation was. And that might be really fruitful. So I'm hoping to do that. If you have any ideas on what to call the channel, although you don't know enough about the, the sense of the conversations yet, let me know. I, can, I guess we can always rename the channel. I can try something to start, but I'm probably going to open that up in the next day or two and, and, and you know invite Scott to it and then ask him if he will talk to me through that channel instead of email uh, and then go from there. But uh, our, our conversations are really interesting because he's coming back and he's like, nah, if, if the majority of the American populace is in favor of democratic policy positions like abortion, like whatever, like like what have a whole bunch of stuff, then why is this a death match? Why is this a knife fight in an elevator? And why is Trump uh, on the brink of maybe winning a nomination and an election again? Uh, there's, and his his conclusion is that there's something very broken about progressives. Yes, I saw Bill. I saw your brow furrow. Now I see your mouth your mouth twist. I'm with you entirely, but. And, and it's a side of the equation I hadn't considered very much. But the more he talks about it, the more I soften up to the idea that, wow, something's really messed up about how we're approaching this. And it has something to do with our inability to talk in the public square, which is, I, I'm not going to both sides this, but it's on both sides. Like political correctness on campuses is the hot issue that the far right is using to shut down. It's, like, it's really interesting. The dynamics I find fascinating. Pete and Klaus. Thanks, Dre. Um, uh, don't let me dissuade you from uh, starting a channel on Mattermost. I think that's a great idea. Uh, in a little bit longer term view, um, I've been wanting to have a, a CSC discourse instance for a while. Um, Bill has generally, generously said uh, I would support that if you did that. <laughs> Wait, reinstituting discourse? Yes. Like CPRing it? Uh, not or... OGM discourse. Uh, it's CSC, CSC discourse. discourse. Okay. Uh, where it's an intercommunity thing. Ah. The uh, Mattermost, uh, Mattermost is great, and it's a good uh, substrate for you know um, in the moment you know in the in the few days kind of thing but it suffers the same thing that any chat system does that um it's got a short memory um so ogm uh, forum was successful i think um we can talk about why why it ended up getting uh, pickled but mm -hmm. um but anyway um, I, I think uh, the, and, and exactly for the kind of thing you're talking about, um, having a conversation that can last months and you know maybe years uh, in, in a discourse is probably a good, not necessarily alternative, but a good adjunct to a chat. Very briefly, I don't find that that Mattermost has that short of memory because I can scroll back up to the top of all the conversations. So I don't know that it's different. It's just that the structure of the threads is different. And for some, and this is only me, for some very weird reason, I can keep up on Mattermost and I just can't keep up on threaded discussions, big forums like discourse. So so that's just my own my own bias on it. But I don't find that that Mattermost is more amnesic than than whatever. And then the second thing I want to add is if discourse were weaving the big fungus, if discourse was leading to a set of issues that were being sculpted by the community over time, meaning you could have the thread of discussions, but every now and then somebody would say, this one right here, we put on the tree, and this is where it goes. 
that would start solving the problem. And it, it, that would bridge some of what you and I are busy looking for. Like, how do we bridge flowy conversation with static knowledge that accrues over time, that gets better and richer and deeper over time, right? And and so if if so, that happened, I'd be on yeah, board. And, but, but that could also happen with Mattermost. I, um, discussion for a longer time. Yeah. I, I think, I, I think if you kind of measure it, um, Mattermost is not, you know, absolutely amnesic, but, um, following, you know, following more than a couple threads over a couple months, uh, in a, in a Mattermost channel is going to get really hard. The same um, difficulty as discourse. No, in a discourse, uh, even OGM forum, we had, probably literally dozens, a couple dozen uh, threads that you could follow over the course of six months or 12 months without any problem. Hmm. Um, and, and in fact, even right now, I think you could go to the, the static, you know, static uh, snapshot of it and still look for the right thread and follow the right thread where that's not a thing that you would do in Mattermost. Um, I, I, think, I think Mattermost is more amnesic than you would imagine. Um, especially compared to something like discourse. Not that, you know, there's a overhead to participating in, in a threaded forum. So, you know, there's, you, you can't, you know, some, something's got to give, but, but discourse also does have kind of natively the uh, very good abilities at curating threads and putting them on a, you know, a long-term tree and all that kind of stuff. So it's really good at that actually. Um, it takes a little bit of skill and 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 information architecture from a facilitation team, but you know that that kind of stuff is not hard. And and actually, we had started developing that capability for the OGM forum. We just never really took advantage of it. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say this has been a fascinating, and wonderful conversation. Thank you. I'm always struck. It's, it's not clear to me, it's not clear to me that uh, human society really scales well and can ever scale well. We, oh, come on. Uh, we have, you know, each of us here and many, you know, many hundreds of thousands of people, it's like, if only we could engineer it a little bit better or only if we could politic a little bit better or only if we could collaborate better um, or if only we could lever up collective intelligence. I. And, and, you know, and um, thank you, Jerry, for, for telling the history and the story of, of um, uh, Vietnam. And, and a lot of the stories that I think we tell ourselves about the success of Apple or the evilness of um, a particular man, uh, Adolf Hitler, or, you know, what happened in Vietnam or World War I or World War II, a lot of it seems to me to be uh, post hoc rationalization rather than an, an understanding of the, the psychohistory to use as a monster to, to actually understand what happened and what you would have been able to tweak to change the outcome. I think it, it feels to me like that's a fantasy that people have because we operate in individual scale and you know a, a few dozens of individuals where you can see the mechanics of how that works. Um, and, and I think it's an illusion that we can, that, you know, that, that same, the same kinds of processes, even if you make the processes themselves bigger would scale to millions and billions of people. I think it's, I, I think, and I don't, I don't, I don't say this with any joy because I wish it weren't true, but it seems really, uh, fallacious to me to think that it actually works that way. So, um, so, and then I guess the, the, the thing forward, the thing that does make sense to me, and you've probably heard this before is decentralization. I, I absolutely know that in, you know, in threes and sixes and twelves and twenty fours that you can change minds that you can actually, you know, politic better, collaborate better, learn to collaborate better. And my hope is that inter uh, inter inter team wise, um, you know, we can, we can find a way forward, but even then I, I think, you know, predicting or engineering or, or calculating or, or, any, or anything much above, you know, thousands of people, uh, even with a bunch of decentralized 
teams working together, you're going to get an emergent thing that that people can't predict. I think, and and so I, and I guess I want to underline when we think we could have predicted. You know, when when we say this is what happened to lead to World War II, that's a kind of a reverse prediction going back to the conditions and saying this is what happened and this is why. I think it's rationalization. I don't think we, I, I think we pull the wool over our eyes when we say we know how that happened. Um, we know that it happened um, yeah. and we can, and we can, you know, draw a line backwards, but I don't think you can draw that line forwards. And, and we, yeah. I don't think we are still, we, we aren't doing that yet. Yeah, no, I, I, I Pete, I, I, I really disagree with you on that one because the entire Bible is based on uh, studying what happened in the past and what commonalities you can extract from that and how that may influence the future. But I, I mean, I, I got to be up like only two minutes, but I wanted to just, um, you know, I looked, I looked at Gaia, at life, right, uh, as a as a living thing, as a living entity. So the planet is alive. So how it came to be alive, we don't really know. You know, we know it got seeded from outer space and there's all kinds, but but somehow um, there is a living entity now. Uh, and that entity is programmed to evolve higher forms of life, greater complexities. And it has withstood all kinds of challenges to get us there. You know, the impact of a meteoroid, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of, of uh, disruptive forces that, that, that created uh, a response to reshape itself. So we don't know if this, if they, what, what kind of intelligence that is. It could be like a program that just runs uh, based on feedback mechanisms uh, and it's on a, on a certain path, but you could you could ascribe a certain mechanistic perspective to it, right? And then think about war. So when uh, we, are, we are observing each country uh, and think about the, the way the Ukrainian war started, right? We, we, we observed that they were pulling troops together. You now they were building hospitals. They were building up the blood supply. So they were making very obvious preparations to invade while, you know, the, 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 the sentiment was, oh, no, they're never going to do this. This is just crazy, right? See, to me, the, the, the planet is rallying forces, you know, the melting of the ice caps, um, the infusion of uh, fresh water, trillions of gallons of fresh water, into the oceans that decreases the level of salinity, which decreases the temperature. You know, so, so you're looking at, at forces being rallied around us that could actually strike in a flash, right? Because if the if the ocean current, if the Gulf Stream collapses, you will have and 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 it is predicted to potentially collapse. There, there is a Linear a linear progression of these of the uh, Gulf Stream slowing down, but then all of a sudden it stops. Right? And if that happens, you have catastrophic impacts uh, on the uh, on the U.S. East Coast in Europe. Um, and it, it would just it would just collapse our civilization as we know it. But there are reports out there this could happen in twenty twenty five. You know, because the 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 uh, outflow of fresh water into the oceans is stunning and it's picking up more speed you now so uh, we, we are we are not paying attention to this global system as a whole because we it just blows our mind right to to but when I when I uh, go into sort of a dream state, I mean, to me, this is just like this living entity there that uh, that absolutely is getting ready to make some really significant changes, right? And and we we have like a limited amount of time to prepare for that and to mitigate for that, but we're not. We're like running around blind, and that's what Pete, what you're saying. So I think I agree with you. I don't think we're capable. Of uniting uh, uh, because we would have to we would have to embrace a story one story 
that everybody acts upon. And that one story is that we have violated the the Gaia, right, the Mother Earth, uh, and and that we need to really very quickly uh, do everything we can individually, personally, to mitigate that. And I, it's not happening. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. It's a tough, uh, tough situation. Should we fold the call? Yeah. Um, great call, folks. Um... <laughs> See you. Bye bye. Take care, everybody. <laughs>